So I'm here with Joao Gonçalves, the head of DevOps uh, here at Valley Space. Now, Joao, you've had a long career in the tech industry so far. Yeah. Uh, already, you've worn many hats, such as graphic designer, app developer, web developer, project manager, and many others before joining Valley Space. Here in Valley Space, you progressed from a developer to a senior developer, and now the head of DevOps. So my first question is, do you now feel a lot of pressure from being in charge of an architecture of a complex software like Valley Space, or does it just feel like the natural progression of someone that spent so much time in the tech industry? Well, it was a nat natural progression because even before starting at Valley Space, I already started changing my career path a little bit into DevOps and continuous integration and continuous deployment. So it was a natural progression. When I joined Valley Space, I joined as a senior developer or just a developer and then progressing to senior. But at, at that point, the day that I joined, I saw that there were some lags and the company was starting to grow and the processes at that time were not scalable. Did you so, say that you saw some lags? Yes. And what do you mean by this? So I, came, I was coming from a very highly um, process uh, enterprise, so big company, where everywhere, everything was very standardized and very formal. Mm -hmm. And when I got to all this place, it was the complete opposite. <laughs> and I saw that, and I knew from past experiences also in other companies that already went through that transition from startup to medium-sized company, mm -hmm. that some things are not scalable. Some things work well with a small team, but as soon as you grow up, they won't. They will fall apart. Can you uh, give any examples of what those things that aren't scalable? Okay, especially were? mostly about we're, since we're talking about development, about traceability. So when it's a small team, it's two, three people, and the code base is small enough, mm -hmm. it's easy to, to for everybody to know all that it's going on because there's only three people and you can talk to each other. As soon as you scale to like a team of ten people contributing to a code base. The code base grows really big, really fast. And it's very hard for everybody to keep track of everything. And so you need to start having processes and traceability around that and also testing because not everybody is going to test everything because it's a huge waste of time. Well, not waste, but a huge <laughs> consumption of time. So you start seeing those things. And I did that process already, or I was part of that process already in another company. So I thought, okay, this is a good chance for me to, to make a, a big difference and then there was nobody with that experience in the team, maybe except for Nelson. So I said, okay, I'll take it on. So I, I continued my work as a developer while starting to make small changes and improving the processes and all that. And eventually that led into Nelson one day asking me, uh, okay, do you want to formally take the job as the head of DevOps? Because at that point we didn't even have a DevOps. Uh, squad. It was just some people doing some DevOps things. And then it was formalized as a DevOps squad and he asked me, do you want to take charge since you're already doing part of it, the development part, not the operations? And I said, sure, I'll take it on. And then the challenge grew. And yes, going back to the original question, it is a different kind of responsibility. Because if you make an error while in software, in development, it should be caught in the testing or in quality assurance testing, functional testing or automated testing. And even if it goes to the production, to customers, it's very rare that it is a, a big mistake. Usually those are around data management. So if you cause any error in data or mm -hmm. data loss, that might cause issues on the customer. But when you're working on DevOps, if I make a mistake, the servers go down. <laughs> yeah. So, in, especially in our case, they're, they're cloud based. So, if I make a mistake, everybody goes down. Mm -hmm. So, the f almost 400 deployments that we have, they all go down. It, it has happened. So, <laughs> so, I guess the question was the. So, the, respons the impact increases. Yeah. With bigger impact, it also increases responsibility. And that's why we tend to follow a different rhythm than the development team. Well, the development team, team still works in. Full throttle. Fast, fast, fast. Fast, fast, fast. These, we are, as develop, DevOps, tend to work a bit more slowly because we don't have the luxury of failing. 
I like that's a nice phrase. We don't have the luxury of failing. No, because a failure in software can be fixed, while a failure in DevOps leads to customer dissatisfaction immediately and can even lead to breach of contract. Mm -hmm. So in our contract, we say we'll provide the software for you within a time of X percent of time. If I make a mistake and the servers go down for a week, that can be considered a breach of contract that can lead to loss. So in terms of, to me, that would feel like big pressure, but are you just confident enough in your own processes and the way that you work? Yes, what we do is we have to follow a process and that's something that I've been implementing and improving over the past time is making sure that we have fail safes so that if I do make a mistake, something will catch me before it reaches. So I, first, before I do any change, I have to build the failsafe for that change. Mm. Mm. Then I can make that change with more confidence that even if it doesn't work, it will be caught before reaching uh, production. So yeah, there's, there's a triple lock, there's a, or a double lock, You're, you have backups on backups in, in terms of process. Yes, basically uh, my life revolves around redundancy, <laughs> backups and disaster recovery. Okay. <laughs> That's the final one that I plan for, but I hope I'm, I will never need it. It reminds me of, actually, if, um, I don't know if you watch The Simpsons, but there's, there's a scene in The, in the Simpsons where there's uh, an elephant that escapes, okay? And they, they cut to the elephant that's running through the, the city. Then there's a, the, it cuts to a shot of a, a peanut factory, okay? And the guy, <laughs> the, the, the project manager of the peanut factory sees the elephant and he goes, okay, people, this is the time that, we've been, that, that I've been telling you about. I told you that we should be practicing for two hours a day for this moment and none yes. of you listen to me. Um, we basically, we prepare for the worst expecting the best yes so we expect that the best thing or the the planned thing will work but we will prepare for the worst case scenario i think that seems like an the, approach that you'd want from a devops yeah and sometimes it might look like as a, a pessimist uh, view of things and sometimes even in meetings it can translate a little bit like i'm the pessimist because i'm always pointing the failures or the poten potential failures but that's my role is predicting the points of failures and the pitfalls that we might end up as a company, especially around the, um, the software, and try to prevent as much as possible. So it means sometimes being the guy that brings the bad news or puts a bit of a bit of cold water on, on things. Okay, slow down. We need to think about this on the implications of this. We cannot just go full throttle on some things. Well, I actually think that the the line between pessimism and realism is a very fine one sometimes, yes. they're blurred. Yes. I want to go back to something that you said earlier in the conversation um, to do with the early days of uh, programming at Valley Space and when there was only two or three developers here. And you said that it lacked process. And do you think that if you lack process in, in the way that you work within programmers, then the code base then takes on a life of its own. It's almost like a monster that can't be stopped. Yes. Um, it lacked process, but it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. So it's a natural stage of maturity in a company. So when you start with the founders, in our case, there were three and the three of them were uh, collaborating in the code base and those, those, that was fine. And then the team grew with three more developers and then I joined. So there was already six people contributing to the, the, the code base. And it gets really hard. And then imagine that one of them goes on vacation and you need to fix something in this code. If you are not aware and there's no sorry, traceability back so that you can check why that was done and not just what was done, mm -hmm. then it becomes very hard to maintain long term. And as the team grows and we're talking about that people right now, the development team is approaching 20. What if it grows to 40 or 50? What happens? No, nobody can keep up with that unless there's progress uh, process in place to keep and also make sure that checks are made throughout. For example, if you're making a change in the front end, you need to make sure that that change will not affect other parts of the, of the front end, but you as a developer don't have time to test everything. So that needs to be a process where at some point someone will check 
if that change that you made will affect anything else. But what you're also saying though is that that the having only a few developers and not much process is not only beneficial, but maybe it's an important part of the it startup is. journey. It is. It, at a very early stage, it is the only way that you can work at the speed necessary for the early stages of a startup. And the, the challenge is not creating processes because that's easy. And creating bureaucracy is easy. <laughs> the tricky part is making sure that those processes exist while not in, impacting the, the workflow or the, the speed of delivery of the team. That's the tricky part, making sure that people are aware of these processes, but they are as transparent and as automated as possible. And that's where DevOps works a lot is in, in automation. Making sure that the process is there, but that you don't need to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Unless in very specific points where it needs human interaction. So that you don't even see it almost. Most, it's 99% yes. invisible. Exactly. My work is mostly well done when nobody talks about me. Okay. <laughs> yes, our motto in, in DevOps is in Valley Space is building the road to production, mm -hmm. meaning that we won't do anything, we won't build a product, we won't build, do the tests, we won't do the business and selling to customers, but we will build all the tools necessary for that flow to work mm -hmm. and making sure that at the end of the road, at production, everything is delivered with the highest reliability possible. So in a sense, you're like a goalkeeper, right? It's a thankless task in a sense that yes. you, no one notices you unless you make a mistake. Yes, then everybody notices you. Yeah, and <laughs> criticizes. But tell me about some of these processes specifically that you've implemented and especially about trying to find that balance between process that yeah. Yeah. doesn't feel cumbersome but allows slickness. Okay. So the first thing that I did even before the DevOps call was, was talk with the leadership team at that point and said, okay, the ticket management that we're using, we were using basically a um, sheet with tasks to do. Okay, we need to work, maybe change into a, a, more a manual of a, sheets or a, yes, yeah. basically <laughs> moving things around. <laughs> so the first thing we did was we moved, and there was no, for example, no sprints. It was just a waterfall scheme. We just did the tasks as they came from customers. So the first thing is did is move to a, a more control environment to manage the, the tickets, is, which is Jira. So we started setting, setting that up and setting then, okay, for each type of change. That's the first thing. Because until that point, all the changes were considered the same. So, but we decided, okay, improvements are to be treated in one way bugs need to be treated in another way. So then setting up the workflows for that in Jira, doing all the automations that, for example, right now, the, the tickets in Jira flow from the starting to the end with zero interactions. Mm -hmm. There's hardly, I won't say all, <laughs> none, because there's always one that I forget about, but there's hardly no transition that needs to be made manually. So. A ticket is created, it's assigned to a developer. After that, when you create a branch, everything is automatically, when you, that branch is merged into develop, it's also automatic, the transition, when it falls into staging and it reaches production, all those transitions from states are done automatically. So that's a good example of how a process was made and now the management can go and check the status of a task. Mm -hmm and see, okay, it's in progress or it's done or it's still in review or it, it went back into to do this because of some uh, requirement that it's not met, but management can do that. And the developer doesn't even need to change manually just by his actions of normal actions of work, it triggers the transitions between states. So the process is there, the visibility is there, but for the developer, there were zero added workload automatically get attributed to them as well? Yes and no, depends. <laughs> it's a hard question, but it is automatically depending on the, where it's created. And also now we have product managers, uh, product owners that assign. 
that's still the manual part because that's still in the what we consider the, the planning part. Uh -huh. So that's not the development. Development starts after assignment. I see. So the planning part is still something that requires a bit more interaction because it's it's very hard to standardize planning mm -hmm. and ideas and conception. So that part is very manual still, but the development part is about much more standardized, so that is pretty much fully automated. And it also sounds like not just is it automated, but there seems like there's a high degree of traceability there as well. Yes, right now it is almost impossible to have any change to the code without knowing us knowing who did it, when and why. Mm -hmm. Those are the three questions that we need to answer so that we can go to the code and this line, who did this, when and why? And these might seem like big brother questions, but they're very important because imagine if I go to a client and that line is causing an issue. Mm -hmm. I need to know when that was introduced so that I can go and check my client's list and see who has that version so that I can send them an email. Okay, you have this issue. If you want it solved, you need to upgrade to this version or this issue was introduced in version 1.10, for example. I can go, who has 1.10 and tell them you have an issue here. Mm -hmm. A potential issue that you need fixing. Or if a customer calls, calls us and tells us, we have this issue, I can go back and check. Oh yeah, that was causing the version that you have, it's now fixed in 1.20, for example. So you can upgrade to 1.20 and you have that issue fixed. But that's, that's only possible with traceability, right? So that's the when. And the when doesn't necessarily need to be a date, but it needs to be, uh, we get into versioning. Yes. So, but I need to know when that was happening and who, so that if I need further explanation on the motives of why that was, decision was made, I can talk to the person who made the change and ask them why was this made? And he can tell me, oh, this was made because of this and this. And sometimes it makes sense. I just wasn't seen because I was not involved in the, in the planning. So I need to ask that person. And also that person usually is the one that will have the easiest time fixing it okay. because he's the one who made it in the first place. And then, so maybe to come back to um, your experience as a developer in the past, have you ever, well, I imagine you have, but trying to fix lines of code that other people have written and then yes. trying to understand their thought yes. process is another and, and, avenue around and it. that's one of the hardest things and even sometimes it doesn't need to be someone else it, it, it can be yourself <laughs> yeah. when you're talking for example for me that i've been in valley space for almost four years i can go back and check my code four years ago i won't remember <laughs> it's almost impossible i've done so much after that i won't remember why did i do this yeah if i don't have a place where i can look at what was asked of me to do that change i won't remember but now I can go back and check what was the reasoning behind that change. And that's a very po powerful tool if you're a developer, being able to question yourself or others about why th that exists. It's funny, I saw um, a meme that you posted on one of the Slack channels this <laughs> week, and it was something like, I finally found the culprit who wrote that bad line of code, and it's Barney looking at Barney. Yeah, yeah. there's another version with the Spider-Man meme, which is basically <laughs> the same thing. Yeah, because it's a very, <laughs> it happens to everybody at some point, like, who was the idiot that wrote this? <laughs> uh, Oops, yeah, uh, yeah, it was actually me. <laughs> when you do a, a git blame, or if you're using Visual Studio Code, you can just with git lens, you can check already. And you look at the name, and it's, uh, yep. <laughs> I'll keep this quiet, I'll fix this yeah. quietly. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> And you mentioned, you touched upon versioning yeah. in, the, in that last answer. Uh, and I'm interested because you've told me in the past that um, you actually try to do two-week release cycles. Do, does this mean that you're we constantly... We do you, currently do two weeks. So it's not just trying, you do them. Yes. So when, I, when we started working on this almost three, three years ago, there were no... There was no versioning. Uh, Valley Space was just Valley Space. So Valley Space, it wasn't even V1, it was just Valley no, Space. No, it was just Valley Space. We introduced Valley Space 0 0.9 uh, before the final push to the Angular interface. And when Angular was introduced, we said, okay, this is a massive change. So this is, let's consider Valley Space 1.0. Mm -hmm. 
and after that it has been increasing is still in one dot something 54 i think it's the latest one but we still haven't made a radical change enough to warrant the to. increase to it's coming uh, i think it should be here in the next few months but it, it hasn't uh, gone into into that so does that mean that let me just try to understand so if we want let's say one version 1.54 yeah. Does that mean that you've done 54 releases in the past? Two long? and something years, two and a half since, yes. And excluding holidays, you've always had a two-week release cycle. And excluding some periods where we found that, it's very rare, but sometimes we found that the, the release was not up to par. Mm -hmm. So it, the quality wasn't there. So we said, okay, let's do the, divide this one more week. And usually... It, so on a Friday that it's considered, that's where I have the meeting with quality assurance. So that's when the decision is made. And sometimes we say, okay, it's almost there. So we'll just postpone it, not a full sprint ahead, but just Confidence. a few, few more days to give time to fix the um, critical bug that we found. But it is a two week cycle. Uh, and it has been for two and something, almost three years now. But if, if it's always a two week cycle, is there a danger that you're just <coughs> releasing something for the sake of it or are there always important updates and things to fix in every release it's a, it's a balance act um and it is tricky we try to put value always not just bug fixing into each release and until now we have been able to okay each release actually adds value to not just with bug fixing which was also valuable but also with new features or improvements to exist, existing features. So we try to cram some, always some value into, into the list. But it's also a way of making sure that the latest is also always available because we don't want to sit on fixes or valuable things to customers and not deliver to them. Mm -hmm. And that goes back into the startup, we're a, not a startup anymore by size, I would say, or we're not in startup mode like we were with three developers, but the speed of delivery is still the same. And that gives, it has its draws, drawbacks, but also advantages. One of the main advantages is that the customers feel that they're getting always an, an improvement mm -hmm. so that the software keeps, keeps improving, it's not stagnant. Because one of the biggest fears about betting on buying software from a startup is that it will go flat. Mm -hmm. So I invested a big chunk of money into a software from a startup and the startup goes bankrupt or stops providing updates. That's a big fear, especially when you're targeting uh, bigger customers the, where the investment is higher from their side. So it's a, a fear, a reasonable fear that they have that the startup will fail and they will be left with a unsupported software. So making sure that they have recurring updates it's a way of us to telling them no we're still working there's still improvements yeah, there's coming in this constant inertia somewhere yeah. but because i've noticed that maybe maybe i'm wrong <clears throat> but it only seems that the customers are aware that these updates are happening with the newsletter which might happen quarterly or every few months or do you think the customers that use the software more will notice that it's been lubricated in some way Okay, so there are a few things that's more into customer success than yes, DevOps. Of course, yeah. But we as DevOps, we, we provide with each release, we, we provide release notes, they go into the documentation internal with more technical description and external with a bit more polish so that customers can look at it. And if you're on the cloud provided software, you get the updates faster and you can, ch you can see the version number is always visible. Mm -hmm. We're very transparent on that. Mm -hmm. You can always check the version number, you can, you can see it changing. And you can check on the documentation, every time there's a release, it goes to the release node. So customers that are involved and are looking for it, they can see the pace of improvements. And also you feel it in the interface. Then we can go into a bit more of a, the other challenge, which is the, the on-site customers. And those are the ones that usually lack more on the updates. But that's um, so with, another big topic. So with the, the, the customers that are using 
banning space on the cloud, does that mean that the updates are just automatically rolling every every week? They don't need to do anything. Every two weeks. Yeah. Every two weeks, sorry. Yes, basically we try to do it at a time that will impact the least mm -hmm. on them. So, but since now we have customers in Europe, uh, United States, and some in Japan and New Zealand, the time zones are uh, overlapping. So it's hard to find the time where people are not working. So we were doing it on Monday nights, and now we're transitioning into do it on Sunday nights. What's the optimal time? Sunday nights. Which specifically hour? I would say it's Sunday nights after 9 p.m. Uh, UTC. Okay. So London time, let's yeah, call it. Greenwich Mean Time. <laughs> but what do you think? So you, that's, I'm, I'm interested about these two week cycles because it seems like magic to me. But what do you think <coughs> gives your developers the ability to do this consistently? Okay. It is hard to do and it requires commitment from everybody in the team to that time frame, but this also requires uh, frictionless processes. Mm -hmm. So people cannot spend time in bureaucracy. People need to spend time doing their, their work. And that's where I came in, trying to facilitate that. And there are also all the checks and balances need to be automated and being placed so that we can trust at the end of those two weeks that what we have is a quality product. And that can only be made with a very well-defined pipeline and very well-defined checks and balances. Mm -hmm. And making sure that it's fully automated because we didn't, if you think two weeks, that's 10 work days at most, eight hours a day, nobody works full throttle. There's always emails and meetings, so six hours a day. So it's not that much time, it's like 60 hours. 60 hours of work, if you're developing new features, it's, it's short. So you need to make sure that people are just working on that and then that those new features are validated in QA also has a, a tough time because they have two weeks to validate the full system. And as the system grows, those two weeks become <laughs> shorter and shorter because to test a full system as value space in two weeks is very, it's very tricky. So we also try to automate any test possible that, that we can automate. There's always edge cases where only by hand you can mm -hmm. check to simulate random behavior, but you try to omit, automate as much testing as possible. And then also the packaging and delivery needs to be automated as possible. So at the end of that release cycle, at the end of two weeks, we say, okay, we have a new version, QA has approved it, let's release it to customers. <coughs> Right now, there's around 400 deployments. We consider the deployment like each customer or each instance of value space is a deployment. On our cloud, we run around 400. And we up can update all of them in roughly four hours. Mm -hmm. It takes around a minute, then it ver varies a little bit depending on the deployment size. And, but to be able to do the, this in four hours, it requires a lot of work from now just the DevOps team. to so making sure that we, the servers are ready, everything is ready, the, the code is deployed, and then we transition each deployment. And each deployment needs to go through a series of steps. First, <laughs> it needs to be stopped. Then we need to run any migrations, data migrations that may exist. So for that's example, why it's important that they're not working on it at the time. Exactly, because to avoid data corruption. But do you have a, ch a check for this first? Yes, we basically shut down any access okay. to, to the deployment. It's basically shut down. We do the, the migrations that are required or not, depending on the version. And then we basically restart. We also do, at that point, any change to server configuration for that appointment is done at that point. So we don't do it any other day. We do all the changes so that it's done through the deployment. And usually the downtime, the worst case scenario that we found until today was a huge data migration. It took two minutes per deployment. In some worst cases, almost four minutes, but that's four minutes of downtime on a Sunday night. Each deployment. Yeah, yeah, but each one starts. In. So I go to one deployment, stop, start. That one was done for a minute. Next one is done for. So there, the four hours 
they're all working for those hours except for the tiny sliver of time slot that uh -huh. that's when they stopped. Uh -huh. And that requires a lot of work around behind the scenes to make sure that at that point you're running the old version for the ones you haven't updated and the new version for the ones you have updated and you're starting. Mm -hmm. You back down on one and you throttle up on the other one. So do you feel um, it's there, uh, like, is, are they the most high pressure minutes yeah. of the two weeks? Yes, that's the, the high blood pressure point <laughs> yeah, of the week. Yeah, yeah. If I'm wearing a tracker, that will probably... <laughs> the, um, and during, we also do simulated deployment before actually doing the deployment. Again, checks and balances. And when we are actually deploying, we deploy to lowest priority first, for example, our internal deployments, mm -hmm. then what we consider the public deployments, which is the demonstration deployment, for example. Then we go into the students teams that we provide, which are not as critical, then into trials. And then finally, after all that, everything, no failures, we go into customers. And that's where the stress begins. <laughs> <laughs> and it has, it has stopped. The process is now much, much or less well defined. So it is almost failure proof, mm -hmm. <laughs> almost. Uh, so I trust it and I usually run and I just keep an eye on it, but sometimes it does fail. And then you need to do disaster recovery. So you need to, if it fails, you need to go to those that failed and pull them back into the old version. And the ones already in the new version, you need to go and check if they're okay, so. And uh, knowing, knowing you, I imagine that you already have a plan B disaster plan already uh, kind of in your head. Yes, we have a, happens. it basically we have a rollback system that if it fails, it tries to roll back uh, mm -hmm. automatically. Okay. And it, most of the times it works. Can it, I ask um, a potentially sensitive question? Sure. Okay, so within this time, is the system fragile from a cyber security perspective? No. And any cyber criminals out there, close your ears right now. No, no, it's, it's at most even more, more secure. <laughs> no, no, it's, it, it doesn't impact that at all cybersecurity at that point. The deployment is completely shut down from the exterior. Mm -hmm. That's actually the only time it's actually more secure because it's shut down. Okay, that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> no, cybersecurity is a big concern for us, but at that point is not an issue. Okay, that's good to know. So, Joao, we, we've spoken for a fairly long time already without really going into depth or describing the architecture of Valley Space. Yeah. We've been skirting around. We skirted bit. around. Maybe you can um, describe <coughs> describe your baby. Okay. Um, Valley Space as itself is a software <coughs> that is um, a how bit... Did you, how did you call it? Valley, mono Space. Valley Space. Valley, oh, Valley Space. <laughs> yeah, Valley Space is a bit monolithic. Yeah. But it it does have some microservices that it relies on. So we're not talking about logical architecture. But maybe you can describe what you mean by monolithic. Okay, monolithic means that it, it is one big system where the dependencies are managed inside the code. It's, it's one system, it's, it's one running, one big process, for example. If you're thinking about your computer, for example, it's one big com program that you're running. Uh, and we are breaking it up and we do have some microservices that that big monolith uh, consumes. So meaning, for example, um, the calculations right now are still done inside that monolithic. So when you make a change in the formula, it runs inside that program. But now what we're doing is we have Valley Engine, which is the calculations engine and it's now receiving the formulas and doing the calculations and sending back the results. And where does Valley Engine live? It also lives, no, we'll, we'll get to the physical architecture. Okay. We're still in the logical. Uh, and so we have a bunch of services that Valley Space consumes. And this, this architecture, it poses some challenges, which is since it's a big program, it needs a lot of resources. And how do you scale? <clears throat> depending on use, use case from customers, because one customer can be using a part of the system and not the rest. And another customer might be using this part and not that one. So that's why breaking it up allows you to scale the part that's being used the most. 
Mm -hmm. And that's where trying to the next logical architecture that's with EVA. Everything as a value is breaking up a bit more so that it's more broken in services that we can scale back and down, up and down cons considering the, um, the usage. But you just t touched on everything as a value. Maybe just describe why it's needed. Okay. Unless you want to go there eventually. It's more a question for the development team, but for us, what is important is that we can measure the usage of, uh, of the Valley engine and everything as a Valley, so it's more broken apart and we can see what's needed uh, the most and give more resources uh, to that part for us as a DevOps. That's the most interesting part. For the development team, it's a, a way of isolating a very core functionality and making sure that it's almost like using an external library or an external service. You isolate it and you just make a small bridge within it and another team can work dedicated just to that and they can do all the changes that they want as long as that connection point is maintained, everything else inside it is irrelevant. So you can have a dedicated team to, to that and also makes you, if you want to make changes to that, you don't need a full valley space release. Mm. Which is interesting, but also <laughs> challenging from our side because then we need to manage two releases. Okay. The valley engine and valley space. Okay. Which is tricky. And it, it, imagine that then they have different de development cycles. One is two weeks and another is four weeks, for example. So that the releases might not match up. Mm. So that's the next challenge for us, as for the DevOps. One of the biggest challenges for the next year, I would say, is what we call internal dependency management. So we have the core value space, and now we're starting to have internal dependencies, internal projects that value space depends on. How are we going to manage this dependency tree or graph? Let's, um, let's dive into that. To describe some of these types of dependencies. Like I said, for example, you have value space and you have value, value engine. In value space 1.54 says, I need value engine 1.0. Okay. That needs to be written down somewhere and it needs to be written down in a way that some script can read it and check for it and making sure, okay, we'll connect that version of value space to that version of value engine. But imagine that we have another customer that it's on an older version or when we're doing the deployment, that one is on the newer version and the other on the newer, uh, older version. So we need two value engines and we need to know which one needs to connect to which one. So that's internal dependency management and doing it manually, it's fairly complex, but it's manageable. Doing it automatically, it's a bit tricky, trickier, especially with a two week release cycle yeah. where we're and it's basically like changing the tire on a moving car. <laughs> okay, it's nice the car image. cannot stop because yeah. valley space cannot stop delivering, but you also need to change its fundamental, fundamental working aspect, mm -hmm. like a tire of a car. So you need to balance it all more to one side. Mm -hmm. So they can, this is a metaphor that applies quite well, that, so that you can take one part and put the other one without nobody noticing it. So in specifically then, are there any techniques that you're, you're developing or, or thought processes to try to change the tire on this moving car? Yes. One of the main things is test, test, and test. Mm -hmm. So we now have separate environments or separate pieces of our cloud, which are on a different architecture now so that we can test and we can test deployment. And eventually it's going to be a very stressful <laughs> Sunday night where that architecture is actually deployed into, as we do the deployment mm -hmm. uh, cycle at the end of two weeks, we also change the architecture. And that's going to be a very stressful Sunday. So maybe we should move a little bit more into then the physical architecture. Yes. So the physical architecture, we use based on all our deployments on AWS, Amazon Web Services. And Amazon provides you uh, a lot of chance for automatic configurations. So they have this very pretty dashboard where, where you can create stuff and that works okay if, when you're managing 
one, two, three, four, five, six, six servers, up to ten, whatever you feel most comf comfortable with. So, but when you're starting to talk about 400 deployments, which right now it's running on 37 servers, managing, managing that by hand becomes a very big task. And there are uh, people, this is not a new issue, it's an old issue in, in DevOps. <coughs> and people have come with all sorts of ways to solve it with uh, Terraform and or other solutions, which basically uh, code as infrastructure. Basically, you write down what you want instead of going on the console and creating a new instance, a new server. You just have one ten servers with its characteristics, and you tell other ways to provide it to you. Oof, and like magic. Yes, and that that is a solution. We ended up going a bit of a different route because our requirements are a bit different from normal usage. For example, if you have a big application like let's say it, Facebook or Netflix, mm -hmm. where the peaks of usage can go dramatically from 80 to 8, then back to 80. Mm -hmm. So that you have a very, you need a very fast response of scaling. So there's a new viral video or TikTok or wherever, you need to scale automatically that really fast so that everybody can access it really fast. Since our business is not to the masses, but business to business, there's not going to be 20 new customers tomorrow or there will be someday, but not today. And the, the demand will not be immediate. And you're not going to have that dramatic spike. No. Even if there's two, 20 new customers, they'll say, I want a deployment. And you can say, okay, it will take one minute to create a deployment for you. Yeah. And uh, one minute is a long time okay. in, in DevOps. <laughs> so you're talking about Facebook that needs to scale in seconds or Netflix. Mm -hmm. And to us, that can take a minute or two. Yeah. That makes a, a world of difference. And we can maximize not for scaling but for immediate performance so what we have right now is, a, is an architecture in other words in other words that we manage it's not manually it's automatically but it's also not done through the normal or considered standard uh, ways of doing it we manage it through our secret weapon which is value admin and value admin is the one point where I spend 80% of my time, <laughs> which value admin is the thing that manages internal dependencies, like we said. By the way, you're just making the secret weapon not so secret. Yeah, but I won't give it all away. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like James Bond. Everybody knows who James Bond is, but he's still effective. Yeah, yeah it's true. Uh, so value admin manages the internal dependencies and manages customer relationships. So it manages the on-site on the on uh, deployments. It tracks them. It tracks the status. It does health checks on deployments. It also does the deployment. And basically what it does is it uses the, the Amazon API or the new, one, the new CDK for Python to tell Amazon what it needs. So instead of using scripting, it's a different, it's still code as infrastructure, but instead of being declarative, where you have a big list of things that you want, like in Terraform, you tell it, I want this, these resources. What we say is, value admin as a database that has the requirements that it needs, and when there's a new client that checks the servers, is there available space? Yes, put it in. There's not, okay. There's a new requirement, create a new server group, and instead of saying, okay, to Amazon, oh, the list went from 10, now it's 11, it just says, I need one. Mm. In one server group, it's a different, then it's like a mini cluster of all space. A server group, it's a self-contained set of servers that contain all the aspects of all space. And this allows us to send uh, send box from one server group to the other. It also allows us to tell a server group to be heavier on resources and redundancy for customers and a bit lower for internal deployments, for example. For internal deployments, we don't need as much redundancy or performance. But it can, does it shift these around kind of dynamically yes. and autonomously? Yes. So it seems like all of your job is about automating perfectly. Yes. But who developed Valley Admin? The first version was developed by Nelson. Um, Nelson, the CTO. The CTO. And Pedro, which is our support engineer. They did the, the first version. 
and Nelson was an active um, contributor to, to Value Admin up until, uh, well, when I got into the DevOps. Then he said, <laughs> now it's your baby, now you take care of it. And there's still stuff there from Nelson and I still ask him for his advice once in a and while. between you and I. But it's... right now, I would say it's 80 to 90% my code. But between you and I, the stuff there that's from Nelson, is there some bad stuff in there? No, no. It's just that he stopped having time mm. to do it. Classic. Because he has many other responsibilities, so he shifted that one to me, and I fully dedicated uh, into that. Yeah. But it's getting to a point that it's managing so much and doing so much that even me dedicated full time cannot. Uh, do everything that it's needed. So do you think as the company grows and progresses, you might need to get somebody on that just oh, definitely value admin full time? Definitely. Because doing value admin means knowing what's coming before. So knowing what's, com what's coming from the development team, mm. knowing the product so that you can deliver it effectively, but also means knowing AWS mm -hmm. and how it works. Mm -hmm. And then it goes into knowing networking and security because Valve Admin also handles some security aspects. It's knowing about integrations with Slack so that we get the notifications that we need. It's knowing how the customer success team works because, for example, if there's a new deployment, I don't create it. I've made the tool so that customer success can create the, okay. the deployment. So it's also knowing about interfaces and all to make it a very hard and tricky problem, very simple, so that customer success can, can use it. And right now, they, they do almost everything without asking us. They can even do a backup of the deployment of the database and, or restore it to a previous state without our intervention. Wow. All done to the value admin interface. This is the autonomy and the automation, I think, that you were talking about at the beginning. Exactly. Right? It's just making everything slicker. Yeah. I think the most time that I went without having any, without opening Value Admin myself was almost a month. Oh, wow. And it's your baby? Yeah. Are you, are you proud of it? Yes. I'm very proud of it. It's the thing that makes us possible. Right now on DevOps, we're three people. Mm -hmm. And one of them is dedicated to the on-site deployment. So Value Admin is what makes possible one person, me, managing 400 deployments on well, call. Just, maybe just give me some context. And update them every two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. But maybe just give me some context. Well, you say that the, so you had, you've got a team of 20 developers yeah. in value space. Oh, so okay. you're saying three is working on DevOps. Is that usually? No, 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 no. The three are not considered to the 20. Ah, the three is on top. Yes. But would you say that's usual or unusual? It's a bit unusual. Um, the ratio is a bit a bit skewed, so you should which have, you is should. a testament to our work. And the value admin. Yes, it is a testament to the quality of work that we do on DevOps that we can do sustain a company this size with this many customers with such a small team. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we are also in charge of internal IT, security, and we're now working with the eyes for the ISO 20. 7001 certification certification and that's also mostly on us also mm. and also supporting enterprise customers that sounds like a lot yeah and we do it with three people and so that's a testament of how much we have been able to automate but it's, it sounds like then the automation is not just a nice to have no no it's, it's actually fundamental it's a fundamental requirement me for me as a set of devops if you do something twice you automate it Yes, I like it. It's a nice phrase. And if, if you don't use something for over a year, drop it. Okay, so these are... These There's always exceptions. Yes, of course. But these are some of the fundamental rules that I pass on to my team. Is you're doing something twice, automate it. In everything, there's no manual work. Everything needs to be visible and saved for the rest of the team. There's no scripts living on your computer. There's no tweaking on a customer, nothing. Everything needs to be standardized and put in place so that the rest of the team can reuse and know about it. 
I think that seems like really, really useful advice that anyone, for anybody that thinks about DevOps. Yeah, it seems a bit authoritarian. And maybe a bit simple. And a bit simplistic way of doing things, but these are core, core fundamentals that we cannot break. Mm. Because if we fail on these, it's like a house of cards, everything falls down. Mm. So we need to keep these core things, principles, in check and everybody needs to abide by them. These are the things as a DevOps team, a head of DevOps, that I, I will not concede on. And you often asking the questions to the other people that are working with you on DevOps stuff. Have you, you know, are you asking the question of, okay, have you done this twice manually? Or have you used this within a year? I hope I, hope I don't have to ask, but sometimes, yes, I, I do ask just to make sure. If, uh, but the people that are working with DevOps, they're very conscious of this. Mm -hmm and everybody makes an effort for this to, to be true. I want to ask another question about the cloud-based architecture and with AWS. Yes, and I just went through very... <laughs> but I just want to understand, was there a specific reason why you chose AWS over other cloud providers? Yes, um, I was not present yet in the company where that decision was made. But if I was to make that decision, I would probably still go with AWS. Why? The tools that AWS provides, again, for low level management, if you want to just create high level stuff, they're all basically the same, like the console itself, the dashboards, creating stuff manually. And if you watch tutorials for the big three, Azure, uh, Google Cloud, and AWS, they're basically all the same things. Because none of them is reinventing the wheel on this. It's servers, it's routing, it's networking, it's security things. They're Speed, all very, I guess. Yes, but they're all very similar on this aspect. What AWS provides is it provides tools for people that want to go deeper. If you want to go low level, old school on it, it allows you to, to do that. And I think that is also possible on the other ones, but I think it's harder to, to get there. But what does that look like going low level on that? So maybe can we, let's be specific. <sighs> so you can, it gives you the ability to, to tinker under the hood. Yes. If, if you want, you can use AWS just like a, a virtual machine farm where AWS does nothing, nothing for you. You can do everything yourself. Mm -hmm. You can set up just the, the DNS uh, tables to point to, to servers and do everything yourself, all the load balancing yourself, everything. Or you can just use AWS services. The, because AWS was built on the EC2, which is the, the instances, which is servers, virtual machines. And it grew from that back on top. So it's now providing a lot of services. For example, managed services like RDS, which is the database service that AWS provides, it's, real, it's great, we use it, it's awesome, we don't need to worry um, almost about anything about the database servers, but you could do it yourself. You can set up a services, install Postgres there, and manage it yourself. We do have something like that because we have for once very specific requirement for internal consumption that RDS was not compliant with that requirement. Uh, so we set up a new server, we went there manually, SSH into, SSH into it, and just treat it like a normal server. So very server admin mm -hmm. type and not just configuring. But that is within that is within AWS? Yes. I see. So you have just a bit of flexibility within it then. Yes. That if you need to navigate around problems, you can, yes. you can fix it yourself. Or, and, that's or why, and that's why we don't provide on, we don't rely on... Um, Terraform or other similar stuff, because we found enough edge cases mm -hmm. where the work to go around the limitations of those systems were more than what we were gaining from using them. I see. That's why we did Valley Admin, because Valley Admin, we fully control it, and we're managing the servers very directly. And so any edge case that we find, we can solve easily, instead of trying to figure out how to work around the limitations of other systems. And what is it do you think that means that we at Valley Space have more edge cases like this? Do you think it's the complexity of the software itself or its niche nature? 
it's a bit about the niche nature of how Valley Space was made and its use cases. So one of the things that impacts a lot on architecture is how people use things. <clears throat> like I said, Facebook or Netflix, it can go really low, really, really mm -hmm. high. Valley Space use, tends to have a more stable usage. There are still peaks, but the peaks are not from usage or from data growth. For example, if you have 20 users, they'll create X amount of values, X amount of formulas, X amount of requirements. If you have two, they'll do roughly a tenth of that. So the usage is very linear growth. What is not linear is the calculation size, for example, because when you start growing through time, your deployment, your data grows. So you're building more complex models within Polyspace. So when you do make a change, the propagation needed is much higher. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a rocket model with 10 parts, you change one, you need to change all the other nine. If you have a thousand, now you need to update 999. And this grows exponentially. The, the amount of calculation sits, it's a graph. It's not a, a list, it grows exponentially. So the, the resources needed don't grow from one day to the other. So we have deployments that need a lot of resources, but it's not from, from today for, to tomorrow. And it's not predictable through normal usage. So we cannot look at how many requests are being made by second to know the amount of work that will be needed in the questions because people might just be checking things or editing things. We need to look at the amount of complex data and the com the trickiest part, which is looking at the complexity of the data in there. So we can look at the database size. It gives a rough approximation of the resources needed, but it can be a big database and not complex. So you might have not one rocket with a thousand parts, but you can have a thousand, a thousand rockets with one part. Mm -hmm. And it's not complex. It's big data, mm -hmm. but not complex. But the one rocket with a thousand parts is complex. Is that because it's interacting with those exactly. other pieces of data? Exactly. Yes. So when that model is updated, there's a big spike in resources needed. So let's think about the future then. Imagine the, imagine the company grows exponentially and so does the amount of deployments. Are yes. you thinking about this already? Yes. So and are you worried? <laughs> and I worry. Uh, we did found some limitations on the way w that we were doing some things in AWS that would not allow us to scale to that point. We're now solving that and I think we found a solution to it. And so I still worry, but I can see the, I can see the path to it, to scalability. And that's where value admin becomes. Even the more deployments it manages, the more valuable. valuable. Weapon. So, yeah, at first, when you're managing 10 deployments, building a huge tool like Valley Admin, it seems overkill. And it was complete overkill. Now, right now, it's, it's, not, looking, it's nice. looking really good. In one year, year from now, it's going to look extra good. Mm. That, and I can see the path. I know what needs mostly what needs to be done. It's just having time and resources, human resources, to build uh, that. And that's why we're now recruiting a few more people into DevOps. It's because the three of us are amazing. We do a lot of things, but <laughs> we're only, You're not magicians. only human. You're close. Nah, we don't, we don't do magic, but some, sometimes it can, can seem like it, but um, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of dedication and it's a lot of careful planning and, and consideration. But you said that you can see the path. Yes. Um, does that path also include a certain amount of out-of-the-box thinking or lateral thinking? And, and if so, do you enjoy the process of trying to look at an issue in a really abstract way? Yes. So since we are doing things a bit different from what you would find online on how to manage deployments on AWS, you will not find a tutorial that tells, us, <laughs> tells you to do... Okay. Actually, we already found a few companies that do it pretty much the same we do. And because they have the same issues, which is there's not one big system that spikes up and down. It's 
usually companies that do business to business. They also rely a little bit on the same tactics that, that we do. So we're not doing something completely unique, but the way we approach things is unique. So I tend to think more in now how I'm going to solve something. I tend to think about more what I am trying to solve and what's the best way of, of achieving that without minimal ripples affecting other things. And then I will get into development part of our event. So that means I'm going to spend a lot of time on planning and defining what needs to be done and then thinking about implications to the system itself. Mm -hmm. And then development sometimes ends up being a very small part of the, of the work. But it's thinking about the consequences, exactly. ma mapping them out in your head. And that's where it gets very tricky to for, try to foresee all the impacts that your small change is going to have. So we just spent some time just talking a little bit about AWS and cloud deployments. But as you mentioned earlier, we also have on-site deployments. Um, so it's, I guess, in these deployments, deployments are localized to these specific businesses. How much of a percentage are on-site deployments at the moment? And maybe then you can also talk about what are the, let's say the differences, both positive and negative, from having on-site to online from both the DevOps perspective and a customer perspective. Okay, yeah, so starting with the ratio, I think on-site is around 20% of our current deployment. It's a fair amount. It's still a fair amount. And most of them are due to constraints on the customer side, especially around data protection that they have requirements from gov their own governments, for example, US-based companies around ITAR, mm -hmm. which is if you do any contracts with government or for defense purposes, or if you're just building rockets, which are considered advanced uh, weapon systems, even if they're not, mm -hmm. if they're just rockets. Even if they're just launch systems. Yeah, because it's rockets. Yeah. It can be used. Yeah. The same technology can be used for weapons. So then you fall into huge set of restrictions on the US that I just don't know mo much about. But for data, that means that the data cannot live outside the US, for example. And if it, even if it's on a AWS, it needs to be on a special part of AWS, which is AWS Gov Cloud, which is where all the government agencies uh, work. And it means that we cannot, we as Valley Space cannot have any access to it, not even seeing it. So they cannot share a screenshot with us of a, a bug that they found. Wow. We cannot see the data. That brings a lot of interesting questions. <laughs> how do you debug and how do you solve a problem that you cannot see? Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to, to, to joke and do the metaphor, which is fixing a, an engine on a car through the tailpipe. <laughs> it requires a lot of patience, a lot of different tools and different mindset from the people doing that kind of support. Maybe it takes a, a different skill set as well, which is communication. Because it is, the other person has to describe this to you. In those cases, communication is very important. So you need to be able to transmit very clearly what you want. And you need to understand from them all the nuances, the things that they're not saying. Because mm. you're relying just on what they're saying. You cannot see, you cannot. We do now have some tools of vlogging that involve no data so it's just activity for example mm -hmm. even that it still depends on the client and we don't collect anything automatically it's always done through them wow. through a local file that they can review it's plain text it's not encrypted at all that they can review and they can say okay you can have this part of it or just this day so it's just, you allow it to just slightly peek under the hood exactly and then we try to replicate on our side with simulated data that we think it's their data or close to their data or, or their complexity. And we try to follow their steps that they said they do to create a bug, for example. And sometimes we are able to do it. And sometimes it's, it's, it's trial and error sometimes. It's just, okay, try this. Did it work? No. 
Mm. Okay, let me think. Okay. <laughs> I'll get back to you tomorrow. So this, <laughs> this is a very tough challenge. Is the one that we struggle most in the onsite, especially because the install process and the update process, it's not the most uh, user friendly. So most of them still requires one of us from Valley Space to be there while they're installing or updating. So imagine we have a client that wants to now have the software in Japan on premise, we have to go over. No, no, we, we can do it remotely. Okay. It's just that we need to be awake at their time I see. and spend two hours doing the install. But if you think about the 20%, how many customers those are, and we're just three people, Yes. we don't have enough hours in the day to, to do that. So one of the next challenges, not just Valve Min, is what we call very or originally Valve Install. <laughs> <laughs> Is the, who, who the has, by the way, who has the authority of coming up with these? Me, <laughs> but I'm I'm the worst at naming. I'm, I either go way off, yeah, or I just stick to the valley. valley well, I've noticed there's a valley bot on Slack. Yeah, it's valley admin, valley install. I yeah, see, I see a theme. There's a theme there, and like I said, sometimes we go way off, and it, uh, I'm not recalling any example, but sometimes it goes a bit off. But it sounds to me... But what, again, just to yeah. not lose my train of thought. Val install is the tool that we're developing mm -hmm. to facilitate the install and update so that we, we have some goals of 90% of people being able to install and update on themselves. Because if you want to scale as a company, that is uh, required. And that's one of the challenges for the next year. So we have three major challenges for the next year. Valley admin to scale to support scaling at the faster rate, Valley install, and the development process needs also refinement. You have a potential here where you get Valley install right that you go from having to handhold 20% of, of installs and deployments. From then, if you taking that, if you can then automate ninety percent of that, yeah. it takes it way down to between two and five percent or something like yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. That's the goal, and also for bigger enterprises customers. So that Valley install is based on Docker, which installs some Docker images from Valley Space, and it works. And if you're a mid-sized customer, that works. But if you're a bit bigger, that's for example for a single server. And we can increase the size of the server, but again, we're scaling everything at the same time. Mm -hmm. And your use case might not be, we don't need to scale up everything. So what we are now doing is we're doing some deployments on customers where it's still Docker, but it's separated through, the images are not concentrated in one server. So Valley Engine is one server, Valley Sim is a, another one, Valley, Engine, uh, Valley Space is the main Valley Space app is another one. And also depends if they're using, and that's why on-site is very tricky. It, it has so many configurations possible because the customer might say, oh, I want this on-premise on my server, on my network. Fine, cool, Linux, Docker, install, it works. But then they say, oh, no, I want this on Amazon at the West Cloud Cloud. Sure, okay, do you want one server? Yes. Oh, but I want to use RDS because I already use it for other things. Fine, we support it, but it's a different configuration. Or the Redis cache, I want to use Elastic Cache from Midwest. Sure, we still support it. You just need to, to do this and this and this. So there's a bunch of configurations. And then there's the final one, which is big enterprise customers that we are working with right now that require scaling because the company is so big that that use case that I was talking about, the, the workload, actually scales almost like Facebook a mm. little bit because mm. it's such a big company that mm. on one day you can have a team of 10 working on the another day, mm. a team of 500. So it, scale, it starts to scale a bit more erratically and harder to predict. So you need to scale in that in minutes, again in seconds or milliseconds. And so we're now providing with those customers a solution based on Kubernetes. Okay. Which, which is 
uses our Docker images that we use for the, the same installation, but now it's on a system that manages workload and manages um, scaling. How do you call it? Kubernetes? Hmm? Say, just say again. Kubernetes. Kubernetes. There's a big discussion on pronunciation, but yes. I think the uh, actual one is Kubernetes. So if we do, the, imagine if we do get, or when we do start to get a lot more enterprise customers with these big, big, big data sets, you're going to have to have another infrastructure change. Mm, I don't predict it because those will always favor on site. Ah, I see. Because they have either it's security, and they already have big IT departments that manage everything, so it's cheaper for them. Instead of paying on our cloud, they just yeah. yes. put it there. It and, sounds and data protection. Yes, you get start to get into the industrial spionage mm -hmm. territory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is real yes and so they are much more protective of their data and they didn't want to trust a small startup from portugal to have their data in some ways it's very logical it makes sense but it sounds like in joao's utopia everyone would be on the cloud it would make my job exactly easier and harder at the same time but it would make it more manageable and in uniform in more than uniform, yes. I could I could standardize more, yes. And I could again it would be under my control. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be under Valley Space's control to when to update. That's one of the things is the cloud is always up to date. Right? This version we deploy on site, we rely on their goodwill to update. If they don't want to update, I cannot force them to update. Yeah. So sometimes the call is oh I have this bug and they said yes, that bug was solved six months ago. You need to update. Ah, but we don't want to update because we have a big um, project coming up, deadline, and we cannot have downtime. Maybe the I won't make a version specific just for you. You yeah. need to update. And maybe the lack of updating means that there's a security risk for them as well. Yes, it also it also means that. But since the update process is not easy mm -hmm. and not pain free. That's why they're reluctant to update. Yeah. If their update is quick, easy, and re reliable, there's no excuse not to update. Sounds like a... Uh, a Think about Windows. Yes. Windows update used to be a pain. It's, well, it still is now. Well, it's much better now. Okay. <laughs> but most of them you don't even see. Yeah. It uh, updates itself, right? Okay. You just tell once in a while, oh, you need to restart. Yeah. But remind, it, remind me later. Yeah, okay. but it used to be a big thing. If you think about Windows XP or... Uh, I remember, always in really inappropriate moments as and well. And it will be big updates, and every update would require a restart. Mm. Now it's just under the hood updating yeah. nice. most of the things. And you think about your phones, it's the same thing. Mm. When was the last time you restarted your phone for yes. an update? Yeah, it's very true. It's but it used to be much worse. Now it just happens, it's the autonomous nature that what you're yes. getting at, it's been and sick. It makes it automated, easy, quick and reliable. People just start doing it, it's fine. You remove the fear mm -hmm. factor in it. Yeah. Maybe that's a, there's a, there's a, a valley update. Uh, it's, no, create. it's a valley install. A valley it's install. Install and update will be the same tool. We touched briefly that whether these on-site deployments um, or the lack of updating might have a security risk. Yes. I'm wondering, as you as head of DevOps, how do you deal with security risks in a really ever-changing digital environment? It's a um, never-ending struggle. Are there any blogs that you try to read to say one step ahead? Yeah, I try to, to follow some InfoSec blogs, some Twitter accounts. Also, AWS posts its uh, recurring uh, warnings. Can you remember these Twitter accounts off the top of your head? No. Okay, they're out there somewhere. They're out there somewhere. And usually when there's a big security risk, it gets around really fast. Mm -hmm. So everybody stopped. And on the DevOps communities on LinkedIn or on Twitter, and there's a, a DevOps Lisbon community. So when there's some big news, it usually gets around really fast. Can you foresee 
what these type of security risks might look like for companies like ours in the next two to five, ten years. Let's it's say. it's almost impossible to predict. You have the case, for example, a few months ago of the very well-renowned log for J. Log for J. Yeah. Okay. Which was basically a very big vulnerability found on mostly Java-based systems. Mm -hmm. We did did a sanity check on ours. We had one tool that was exposed, but it was an internal tool, and it held no data. Uh, it was just a code analysis tool, but we did update it. But I know companies that spend weeks fixing them, uh, because then you say, oh, this dependency that we have is, is vulnerable, but it's an old dependency. So we need to update the dependency. That means updating the code, because it, or else it will break without dependency. So th that's a big risk. If tomorrow there's a, a bug found in one of our core dependencies, it will be a struggle, for sure. So it's very hard to predict, because those are the worst ones, which is of the z day zero or zero day uh, vulnerabilities, which is, are the ones that are already there. Mm -hmm. They're not new, they were just publicly known now. Mm -hmm. So you need to fix now, because they're already there. You didn't do anything wrong. They're just there. And that's one of the advantages of relying on the cloud is AWS does a lot of that. So, and it also does a lot of traffic monitoring. So it has a lot of built-in checks and balances, checks and balances, especially because the code is up, it's running, and then we do the sandboxing. So there's a lot of things in place to, to prevent, even if something like that happens. If I have no way to fix it, that I can at least shut down mm. while I fix it. But it is a never-ending struggle. Um, and one of the things is, as DevOps, we also try to learn about these, analyze our code, and pass information back to the dev team so that they can be aware when they're doing new things that they don't create any other security risk. Look, I know that you're interested in geopolitical affairs and, and things of an international flavor. Okay, so yeah. let's zoom out just a little bit and think about the bigger picture. So you mentioned zero day attacks, and we hear a lot about the talk of potential to play of the potential of cyber to play a big part in modern warfare. Yes. and we've seen this with things like Stuxnet, um, zero days attacks, and things that can critically affect nations' infrastructure. My question is, how much does the potential for future attacks worry you specifically? It worries, worries me a lot. Because at the state that the company is, one data breach would probably mean really bad news for the company. It's almost survival risk at this point. Maybe let's talk about it actually from a, not just a company level, but from a nation state level, from a political level, and whether and from yes. your, own, your own personal there's security. No, there's no 100% secure system. The only one is a safe computer is a computer that is shut down and buried in con concrete 10 meters underground. Even then. <laughs> so what we can do is, and the, there's always a struggle, which is the reward effort equation. So we have to make the effort bigger than the reward. Right now, the reward is our customer data. If we get bigger customers, the reward grows. So we have to make the effort also bigger. Mm -hmm. So there's always this dynamic going on. And that's where the onsite comes in, making my life easier. Not just harder on the install update, but this makes it easier because then most of the security concerns are for their IT departments to consider. We just have to work with them to make sure that value space itself is so safe, as possible, has secure as possible. Mm -hmm. But then all the networking around it is their job, not mine. Mm -hmm. For the cloud, that's my job. And that's why we worry uh, more. And as the company grows and grows in visibility, the bigger target it will be. Do you think that, and I'm going to try and, uh, I know you're coming at it from a, from a company perspective, but I'm going to try and give it this, this international <coughs> flavor. Do you think a small country like, a small and relatively peaceful company like Portugal is still at risk yes. of... Like I said, it's just that 
someone that is interested in one of our customers will target us to get to that customer. Yes. Yeah. And you, you mentioned that no system is safe. No system is safe. And whoever tells you otherwise is lying or wrong. Yeah. That's it's kind of, um, it's kind of worrying in a way. It is, but again, it's, you can take it as a house. No house is secure, no bank is secure. It's just a matter of how many sticks of dynamite you need. <laughs> That's a really good point. It's like the lock in your front door. Uh -huh. You buy a better lock, there's always a thief that knows how to open. But if you have a Monet painting in the house, you're going to buy a big lock. Yeah. And reduce effort, the amount of people that know reward. how to, uh, yes. yes, exactly, to pick that lock. And, we also, just, we and just, also consequences, because the bigger the reward and bigger the effort, the bigger the impact, also the consequences. So if someone steals your plushie from a house, the police is not going to act on it. But if someone steals a Monet, then things start moving, then big agencies start. And again, if someone steals the data from one of our very small uh, students teams. It's, yeah. Not, no one gets involved. If, someone, if there's data stolen from one of our US based customers, yeah, then well, there's a lot of big. Uh, or companies that are working with the ESA. Yeah, right? exactly. So, so it scales up. It scales up, and the amount of cons consequences and people interested in solving that will also scale up, mm -hmm. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. I hope I never get the call like that. But, <laughs> but you have to be ready. You have to be ready, yeah. We mentioned Portugal just briefly, and you can see here that we have some Portuguese cakes. Do you have a favorite? From those? Yes. Or from the whole Portuguese? Well, let's, let's talk to them. It's a, it's a good sample, I would say, but okay. Portuguese uh, traditional sweets is a very wide... I've noticed. A very wide range. I've noticed. But for these, I would say it, yeah, I'm very split, torn between the pastel nut and the queijada. Queijada. And then what about if, if it's just in the whole range of Portuguese treats, which is your favorite? <coughs> I would say tijolada. Describe it. It's similar to queijada, but it's wider and flatter. And the flavor, it's more eggs and less uh, queijada. Nice. Well, aside from the delicious... And it, it's traditionally made in a very small clay mm -hmm. uh, bowl, mm -hmm. which is a tigela. That's, that's the name. Tijuada. Tijuada. You need to try it. I will, definitely. But aside from these delicious treats, why do you think Portugal is a nice place for programmers to come and work? Well, there's always the cliche things like the weather mm -hmm. and uh, the security aspect of Portugal, Portugal. It has its issues, but it's one of the most safest place uh, countries to, to be in. And then while being that and still being removed from Central Europe, you still have access to trains, planes, and you take a three hour flight here in Paris, for example. Less maybe, I think less. Yeah, give like my average. <laughs> yeah, my well, average. But you're so close to Madrid. But then, if you want to travel to the other side of the Atlantic, you're so closer. So if you want to go to Brazil or to the US, US, you're close enough. And that, but that's all. Those are all the the cliche things. And one other reason is programmer salaries versus Portuguese average salaries. The it's a bit. I don't want to praise on it because I don't, I'm socially don't fully agree with it. But I don't think our salaries as programmers should be lower. I just think average salaries should be higher. I think but it, it creates an opportunity where you can have a quality and standard of living higher than if you're a programmer in Germany, for example. Because the cost of living there, you will earn less, but the cost of living will be much less. Yes, you can have a lot of queijadas with, you know, with that salary. It, it buys a lot of pastels now. Yeah. It does indeed. Yeah, that's true. Okay, I have one last question for you. Um, how do you switch off? That's one of the hardest things when I transition into DevOps. Because when you're work, working on development, it's hard to switch off because you keep thinking about the issue, the problems to solve. If you're an engineer, 
that's the thing you love solving problems so you keep it like in your mind and you, then you are in the shower and mm-hmm. I got it but when you're working on DevOps it's that plus the stress of knowing that at some time you can get a call a customer is down and then we haven't started doing that in value space but at one point we'll start having 24 hour support because we have customers in New Zealand and Japan and etc so shifts or uh, being on call will be something to think about but uh, so being on DevOps created a bit more difficulty in shutting off I can never shut off my phone or laptop completely because for example if I go on a weekend I need to bring my laptop just in case just in case there's a breach data breach and I just need to shut down everything down immediately I need my laptop Mm -hmm. so I can never be for now, I can if another person is warned, okay, I can tell the other team members, okay, I'm going to be off. For example, on my vacations, I, I don't take my laptop. My wife has forbidden me from doing so. <laughs> <coughs> but I, at that point, I warned the team, I'm going to be off. So someone else needs to be on call. Again, it seems like you're creating checks and balances exactly. there, you're a fail-safe option, a plan yeah. B. There's a plan B and a C. <laughs> So someone needs to be aware that I'm off and I need to tell the people that would call me to not call me and call someone else. So there has to be a chain of command almost. That I'm, if I'm removed, it needs to go to that person. So that person will have the authority to act. Now that um, you can call me, but you better make sure that <coughs> it is important enough to call me. So going back to the switch off, yes. On vacations, I switch out all notifications on the phone don't bring my laptop and read books and not stuff. On, on my day-to-day basis, I'll read mostly on uh, either a tablet or my phone. On vacations, I'll read on books, paper, to not have the temptation of switching to whatever. Sometimes it's just nice to be analog. Yeah, sometimes. Nice. Uh, and also, <laughs> yeah. but the thing that keeps me most off is something where I can focus completely and I think about work and that's where I got into into paper craft. Ah, actually we have some examples here. Exactly, we have two examples here. And what do we have, Saturn V? This is a Saturn V with a launch tower and that is one of the first, if I think the first space shuttle, which was Atlantis. Amazing, and so you're talking about um, having something analog, you can't get much more analog than paper. No, it's just you shut down completely and you just go paper, scissors, or in my case, uh, exacto knife mm-hmm. and glue. And, and how long would this take you? Uh, so let's say Assassin 5, how long did that yeah, take? Yeah, that hours? one took me, I was less experienced then and it took me three, four weeks after work, obviously. <laughs> yeah. uh, that one, the space shuttle is a bit more complex. That took me, I would say a month, month and a half, something like that. And now I'm working on a project that has over 400 pieces. Wow. And that's, I've been working on it on and off for two months now and it just barely started. Do you find it meditative? Hmm? Do you find it meditative? Yes, meditative, yes. Maybe you like seeing incremental progress happen. It is incremental process, so it allows you to see the progress, but it's also, it's so hands on that you need to focus so much that there's no other room in your head for anything else. Nice. Amazing. Well, Joao, look, I think that was a great conversation. I really enjoyed to get to know yeah. more about what you do in DevOps and also how long it takes you. I've seen these for a while, how long it takes you to, to make them. It's impressive and I'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with next. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.